So, <clears throat> you know what? Christianity is a journey. Jesus said, follow me, actually 19 different times in the gospel. When Jesus called someone to um, become a Christian, he, he didn't use that word Christian. Actually, Christians weren't called Christians for, for quite a long time afterwards. Uh, he would simply go to someone and say, follow me. And of course, follow me implies that he's going somewhere. It's a journey. And so Christianity is a journey. It's, it's uh, all about that. And the word, we, we looked at this uh, a few weeks ago, uh, the word for church is ecclesia, a Greek word that uh, really everyone should know because it's so important. It's translated church. <clears throat> Unfortunately, that's not a great translation into English. The ch word in English is based on the German translation. When they translated the Greek into German, they used the word for the building, kirk which is, a, is the structure, and it was, it was meaningful. It made sense to the Germans because that's where people gathered. They knew that that's where people gathered, and so they weren't talking about the building. They were talking about, well, that's where everyone gathered because church means a gathering of people, a community of people called together for a purpose. All right, so obviously it's not just a building. It's also not just a random selection of people. Staying at home, even if they believe in Jesus. Amen. That's not the church. I'm sorry. It's not the, what the word means. As much as you may want it to mean that, and there are people today uh, that are actually kind of loudly proclaiming that, you know, you can be a Christian and just stay at home. Uh, I'm sorry. You can't be the church and stay at home. All right. You can be a Christian. Christianity is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You're following Jesus. But if you're following Jesus, you're going to be in community with all those who are following with him. I don't know why my phone is making noise. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> so, and we're on purpose. Okay, so we're called together to do something, and so that is a journey. So let's look at these five points. We're going to look at the five points that we just talked about, a journey, the destination, the cost, the duration, the community who's going with us, and the reason for the journey of being church. What, what does it mean to be on a journey? What does it mean to follow Christ in community with the purpose? And um, this is where I'm going to do more than what a person should do in a sermon. Okay? <laughs> I'm breaking the rules this morning. We're breaking the rules. So uh, I'm trying to cover way too much. And so please bear with me. But we want to look at this idea of this journey from an eternal perspective, from the big picture perspective, but also from a um, more immediate or um, real down-to-life, day-to-day perspective, uh, from both the personal application and the application of us as a church and particularly, I'm here to tie in to the journey, our 320 and Beyond initiative that we've been talking about since November. <clears throat> and if you are been around, you've heard about it. Uh, but we, you know, we want to bring this up often enough that people remember it and understand it, but not so often that they get tired of hearing about it. <laughs> and that's kind of a fine line. Um, uh, so it's very important, and we've never done something over a, a numerous years as a church, and so it's my privilege or honor or obligation, depending on how you look at it. I get to talk about this when we're talking about uh, being church, uh, but I'm going to tie it in. I'm not just talking about the 320 and beyond, uh, and if you don't know what that is, this, this brochure explains it all, and there's copies of it sitting over there. It's, it's just to sum it up, it's our goal to raise $1.5 million over the next several years to, uh, do, uh, to accomplish different um, uh, things at each of the three congregations. And we'll mention a few of those things as we talk through, the, uh, through this message. But I want to tie that in to the big journey, uh, both personally and as a church. <clears throat> and I want to tie that in to the immediate application of our day and our lives and the eternal application. So are you ready for that? Okay, let's go. Let's get this started. Let's rev our engines. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> let's get the clicker to work. The clicker is not working. The clicker was working. No, the clicker is not working. Did you, did you do anything on the computer? Did you click outside the window? Yeah. Ah, I thought so. 
<laughs> Don't click outside the window. <laughs> All right, destination. Jesus said to him, uh, this is one of the most powerful verses in the New Testament. You can say that, you know, all the verses are powerful, but this really uh, uh, nails it. It says, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so Jesus, in this passage, is Jesus the destination? No. What is Jesus? The way. He's the road. Okay. And so what's the destination? The Father. And I like it. It's not heaven. Most Christians misunderstand the whole concept of heaven. All right? Uh, it's, it's a person. And the way to get to the person of the Father is through the person of Jesus Christ. And so the journey we're on is a, a journey of relationship. We're called to a journey into relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ, his son. And so the idea of Christianity being a journey is really important because Jesus says, follow me, and he describes himself as the way, the passageway, and that we're going somewhere, we're going to the Father. Uh, the immediate application, well, what does that mean for you and I what, uh, in our day today? It means that we're called to live in relationship now, all right? This doesn't happen when you get to heaven. All right? In fact, to get to heaven, you need this happening now. Does that make sense? All right? Uh, this happens now. We need to learn how to live in relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ. And as we follow Jesus, we get closer and closer to the Father because that's where he's taking us. And so we keep our eyes on Jesus, but we understand that Jesus is taking us deeper into a relationship with, with the Father. And, and this is one thing I love. It'll take an eternity to get to know an infinite God. All right? And so for the rest of eternity, we'll always be growing in our relationship with the Father and with the Son. Because you can never exhaust getting to know an infinite God. All right? Further up, further in is... Uh, C.S. Lewis says, and so as a church, we need to do that individually. As a church, we need to become better at leading people into relationships, Amen. into this relationship. That's what JLK is all about. It's, it's uh, Jesus Loves Camel's You. It's in, 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 equipping us to get out on the streets and talk to strangers. The real purpose of that is to uh, break down your resistance and help you learn ways to bring up ministering to, uh, to others about Jesus uh, to people you know, all right? And sometimes you practice to people on the street because, you know, who cares if they don't like you? <laughs> You'll probably never see them again. But we learn how to minister the love of Christ to those in our lives. And, and New Day, we need to get better at this. I want to see a lot, of, lot more people get saved. And there's, there's thousands, there's 150,000 people minimum within 20 minutes of where we're sitting right now that have no real connection with God, probably... Uh, uh, don't even know who Jesus is. They certainly are not going to church on a regular basis. And they're just, just they're within our reach. We don't have to go to the ends of the earth. Um, and so we need to figure out how to do this. We need to find ways. Uh, and we, as a church, uh, develop uh, programs like GLK. We participate in that and other ways. But personally, we need to do this. Why? Because that's the journey Jesus has called us on. All right? Uh -huh. And if you're going to follow Jesus, it means leading others into relationship with Jesus. How 320 and beyond works into this is that each of the congregations have uh, barriers or limitations <clears throat> that uh, are uh, keeping us from growing in this way. And we've identified those things for each one of the three congregations. This is our, our main congregation here at Nichols. And we need to improve this facility. How many people went to the wedding yesterday? Wasn't that a great uh, church, uh, Agape? And they, they really, because I knew what it used to look like, and I know the, what they went through to make those changes, and now they have this beautiful entrance and foyer and fellowship area. It was really well done. I'm like, I want that. I want that. But it took them years to raise the money, and they had a vision to do that, and they implemented it. And uh, we can have that here. And so a beautiful entrance and foyer space and additional classrooms. Why? 
because that's part of the journey <clears throat> to get us where we need to go. Um, the other congregation, Vine, needs. To, we paid this off. Thank God, we we did. Uh, are, we're well on the way. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Vine needs uh, to be paid off, and we need additional improvements in, in there, and we need to uh, pay off and then hire staffing for our country church down in Vandalia. So those things <clears throat> are waypoints on the journey. Those. Those things, raising in 1.5 million. Guess what, guys? That's not the destination. That's Duluth. <laughs> I don't want to get to Duluth and stay in Duluth, okay? All right. But you know what? In order to drive around the, the largest lake in the world and, and have bragging rights, it's one of the top rides in the country, if not the world, I got to go through Duluth. And if I don't go through Duluth, I can't, I can't complete the journey that we're on. It's just a waypoint. It's not the destination. All right? So if I break down in Duluth, come help me. Because I'm going to go the whole way. All right? And that's how we have to look at this 320 and beyond and all these other waypoints on the way. Um, so a little bit more about the destination. As a church, <clears throat> really our destination is maturity. It's growing up and out. We want each, each believer to grow to their greatest potential in Christ, and we want to reach more people. We want to get better at what we do um, so that we can reach more. I was with uh, the nuns. There's Mike and Lucy are a couple that um, uh, Jimmy and I went, and they live in England. And they're really wanting to get a church started in England, and they're looking at moving to a new community because in London they found it very difficult to find any uh, place to meet. And we were just talking about, well, what do you want? What's your vision for a church? And, and he just, he's stumbling over the words, and he just said, I just want a church like New Day. Remember that, Jimmy, when he said that? And Jimmy looked at me and like, wow, that's kind of cool. And I've heard that so often is that we have <clears throat> something really valuable here as a church, as a community, the culture we have, and we want to steward it well. And that means nurturing, stewarding something means nurturing it, keeping it healthy and growing it, multiplying it, reproducing it. And we do that primarily by raising up leaders and releasing people into ministry. I've said this many times, my job is not simply pastoring a church, but raising up and releasing others into ministry. And so that may look like vocational ministry, where Jimmy is now part-time on staff, or Mark Morris is full-time on staff, and he's just functioning in ministry and having the time of his life. But for most people, that means raising you up in ministry, and that may not, that's not vocationally, but being a, a fully functioning, a, a life-giving, a fruitful Christian in the business world, at, working in, in, in IT or, or working... For the government, God forbid, no. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> being a teacher, being a nurse, working for a corporation. Um, and so raising you up so that you can be fruitful in that. And then, of course, launching more churches, more ministries, and seeing our community impacted with the gospel of Christ. And there's just so much to do, um, and we need to be equipped to do it well. All right. Uh, how much is it going to cost? Well, let's zoom back out. We had zoomed in on the, on the destina uh, destination. Let's zoom back out. How much is this going to cost? Jesus said it this way concerning the eternal cost and, and what it means. It says, he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. When Jesus said, <clears throat> he who does not take up his cross... Everyone who was listening to Jesus knew exactly what he meant. Because they lived in a city where on a regular basis, the Romans would uh, uh, um, convict a criminal, and their punishment was to carry a literal cross down the road to the place where they would be hung on that cross until they died. It was a gruesome, horrible, torturous death. And when Jesus said this, there was no fooling what he meant. You need to carry your cross. And that means you need to give up everything that is yours. To live sacrificially, individually, this means we live, Christians are called to live um, uh, sacrificially with the promise of gaining eternally. All right? It means giving all that you have, 
but understanding that the promise is you'll get more than you can ever imagine. Famous person, Jimmy Elliott, who was martyred for his faith, said he is no fool who gives, with, uh, who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. All right? That's not a foolish thing to do. That's wisdom. <clears throat> so the immediate application, of course, for you and I is that we live sacrificially. We find ways to live uh, a, a life of faith. For the church, it means raising this $1.5 million to reach the, the 320 and beyond uh, goals to position each of us to overcome those barriers. It's asking us to um, give above and beyond the tithe. You know, the tithe and what the normal giving gets us to where we've been operating. But we need, we're making this push to get ahead and to make an advancement so we can grow even farther. And so prayerfully asking each and every uh, person to say, what can I give above and beyond? I just want to tell you that... Um, so the first benchmark was to pay off this mortgage, and we announced that in late November, started taking the collections in December, and by March, we paid off this mortgage, $170,000. Hallelujah. In April, the team got together and then decided the next benchmark would be raising $100,000 by the end of 2018 to pay off Vine, uh, and to set aside money for both drawings for the addition on this building and future staffing for Vandalia. So we need to raise 100000 by the end of this year. And guess what? We're already, this year, two-thirds of the way. We wow. have over $65,000 wow. toward the $100,000 mark. Come on! <laughs> Glory! So we're moving we've got momentum what makes what blesses me the most is that every week i get a report i don't look at how much you give individually i have access to that information but i never pull it up unless there's a reason like you come and ask me uh, for a report or something <clears throat> but i do get a report as to how much came in regular offering each designation so if you put missions i see how much is given the mission or alms given to the poor and 320 is one and Every week, almost, I think it's just about every week, if not every week, every week some money comes in from at least one of the campuses, but pretty much all three congregations, every week someone's giving something to 320 and beyond. And that's what blesses me the most, that people understand this and are giving a little bit above and beyond uh, and, and um, uh, to this initiative. Uh, and we can do this when we work together. So thank you, church, for doing that, for, for bearing the cost. All right, duration. How long is this going to take? Well, our journey is Christianity, again, zooming back out to a more eternal perspective. Uh, Revelation says, be faithful unto death. It's going to take till you die. <laughs> and I'll give you the crown of life. That's the Christian journey. How long do I follow Jesus in order to qualify for going to heaven? All right, till you get there. And then you keep following him, right? It's faith is a commitment that never ends. But the immediate application is personally staying the course over your lifetime. And I could now say, you know, not, one, I'm older now. Let's just say it, I'm getting old. <laughs> but I've been a Christian for at least 35 years. All right? I've been a pastor for over 30 years. And so the this, this staying the course lifelong is really, it's, it's, it's the big deal. Amen. And people can get on and get excited for a few years. And I love the, the faith of a new believer and the passion and the zeal. But it, there's, there's a difference between that and stewarding that well over the course of decades, over the course of a lifetime of disappointment as well as victories, you know, and the pace of life, being able to endure. And so <clears throat> it just doesn't mean that you stay in the same church your whole life, uh, because we see even in the New Testament, people move about actually quite a bit. But it does mean that you stay the course in relationship. Remember what the journey is, that we're a people called into community to a purpose. So you may change churches because you have to relocate for a job or for whatever reason, God may call you to a different place, but you stay plugged into that purpose, all right? How long? Yeah, till you get to heaven. Faithfulness is demonstrated daily. It's constant. It's not intermittent. 
You know, uh, uh, you don't want an intermittent spouse. You know, well, sometimes they show up. That's no good, is it? You don't want an intermittent savior, do you? You want God just to... God's always there. He never changes. Now, our perception of his presence changes. And sometimes we perceive that he's close, and sometimes we perceive as though, God, where are you? He even says that in Scripture. Oh, God, how long will you forsake me? God hadn't moved anywhere. All right? I was just going through a season where it didn't feel like it. Why? So that you could test your level of endurance. Are you going to stay on the journey? <clears throat> so the 320 and beyond, we can accomplish that. To zoom in to the uh, specific, we figured out, you know, we could accomplish that in three years. That's not what the 3 in 320 means. 320 is a reference to Ephesians 320. That's as soon as possible within our, our demographic amount of giving that we have that we could make it. But it's not a three-year initiative. It's, it's till we get these things done. Because each church needs to have these things accomplished in order for each congregation to grow beyond. And so, yeah, let's, I would love it. And we are on track to getting it done in, in three years. So that would be by the end of 2020 or by January 2021. The buildings would be paid off. We'd have the pastor in Vandalia. We'd have um, uh, an addition. And again, if we reached the goal, not only built but paid off here, and uh, we would be set. All three congregations would be positioned that they could uh, continue to grow, uh, at least doubling in attendance easily. So who's going with us? Community. <clears throat> this is a longer verse, but I won't talk about it as, as much. Um, this verse is great. I love how it, it captures the uh, essence of community in the church. It says, for through him, Paul wrote this to the church in Ephesus, for through him, Jesus we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Uh, now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place, of God in the Spirit. I think Paul gets the award for mixed metaphors in this, in this passage, okay? He compares the church to a whole bunch of different things. But this is very, very powerful. <clears throat> it says, um, uh, uh, you're no longer strangers and foreigners. There's one part. Okay, it says, for through him we both have access and, and to understand this verse, let me just explain who he's writing to. He's writing to a church that was mostly Gentile, and he was explaining to them how the promises to the Jewish people now includes, now are promises for all people in Christ. And so the both uh, were, uh, are the two distinctions that were present when Paul wrote this, and that was you were either Jewish or Gentile, Gentile being all ethnicities that were not Jewish, all right? And that's how that, that was the worldview uh, that, from what Paul was writing, that were, there were Jews and were Gentiles. Jews were the chosen people of God to, to bring about the Messiah. But the Messiah then took the promises of God and made them available to all people all over the world of every race, every tongue, every nationality. And so those two become one. And that means we're fellow citizens. We're of the members of the same household, okay, that we're a temple together and a dwelling place for God. And um, that means to, uh, eternally in the big picture application that we are his people. And it was Jimmy just a few weeks ago when he was talking about the business of family, that church is a family. And it's a family that extends into eternity. And so that community is very, very important that we come together. It's a big part of the journey. Church isn't theoretical. All right? It's not just an idea. It's real. Look around you. The church isn't this building. It's the people sitting here with us and meeting the needs of one another. And there's actually a hundred times, I looked this up, I didn't, I didn't check, I didn't verify this, but some website said there were a hundred places <laughs> where there's a command uh, for one another, like love one another, 
bear one another's burdens, right? Uh, submit to one another. All these different commands, a hundred uh, ma- commands in the New Testament that, of how we're supposed to live in community with one another. And you can't do those unless you're in a real relationship with other believers. And so we're calling people into relationship with God through Jesus Christ and into relationship with one another as members of the church, as part of that temple, uh, a part of that community, part of God's household. And I think this is one of the best parts of church, all right? But sometimes it's messy, isn't it? How many have had a hard time with other people at church? (laughs) People come to me and complain about they've been hurt by church. I'm like, dude, or do that. Dude, do that. Uh, I've worked full time for like over 30 years in the church. You think you've had a hard time with people in the church? (laughs) You know, I have nothing to whine about. Okay? I'm serious. But I see the bigger picture. I understand that's that's just a little part of the price. How many have had a hard time with other people in your family? (laughs) I just spent three days with my one brother and one sister. It wasn't even all of us, just three of us. That second day was hard. (laughs) I was like, oh my goodness. We still loved one another. We're just grating on one another. And it was great. (laughs) So that's the same thing with church. We're family. We're family. That's what it means. We're going to get through this together. We're on a journey. And so how can we build community within the three congregations as well as between the three congregations and th- working together uh, on 320 and beyond? Is this that zooming in again? That's not the destination. That's just Nipigon. I got to go through Nipigon. I would never just drive to Nipigon, but I got to go through a little town called Nipigon because it, it enables me to complete the journey of driving around the largest lake in the world. <clears throat> All right, reason, why should I go? And this is from Ephesians 5.25. And this verse is almost always used in the teaching about marriage. But the reference to marriage was just so we could understand the real purpose of this verse. And so what I've done is I've edited out every reference to marriage and just left in the part that Paul was really talking about and God's trying to communicate in this passage. And this is from Ephesians 5.25. So Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. And then John also said, this is uh, near the end of the Bible, when John is seeing the manifestation uh, uh, prophetically of the return of Christ. He said, I saw John, uh, then I, John, saw ho- the holy city, New Jerusalem, which is a reference, and if you read through the scripture, it's very clear that this is a reference to the church, coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And so the church is the bride of Christ. And Jesus loves the church. Now, you know what? The church wasn't perfect when that was written. You can read about it in the book of Acts. They would fight over the food. Okay? Paul and Barnabas actually fought to the point where they split up. They had a church split. A missionary split. (laughs) There was contention. There were arguments. There was division. All right, all the same things that happen in our church today. But you know what? Christ loves this because it's our family. He loves the church. And it says that he's going to wash the church and present the church so that she should be, she will be holy and without blemish. But you know what? That means right now, we're not quite there yet. There's still some blemishes Jesus is working on. Does that reduce the amount that he loves? No, not at all. It's because of that love he's committed to make the church beautiful. And we will be that bride that is presented to uh, Jesus by the Father. The ultimate reason then on an eternal zoomed out scale is love. 
All right? It's love. Our, our journey as Christians is because we're in a relationship of love. And that's the only motivation that can last in eternity. That's the only motivation that can last until death. All right? Any other motivation is just not worth it. Raising money to build a building, it's not worth it. It's not worth just driving to Duluth. Is this making sense? What what's, makes it worth it is love, all right? And Paul wrote this when he's talking about the church. What makes serving in church worth it is love. Paul said to the church in Corinth, he says, I'm jealous for you. The jealousy of God himself, I promised you as a pure bride to one husband, Christ. And so that was the motivation of Paul, was uh, that, that the church was the bride of Christ. And so we need to apply this personally and that we need to love one another. We need to love our union with Jesus as his bride, and we need to have that the motive and the foundation of every act of faith. And when you boil it down, that means that that needs to be the reason we're on this journey. Love for and from God. All right, we're in this for, because of the love of God uh, and, and for the love of God to, to receive and to give it, as well as for and from one another. And, so, and, that, and that then, to the real specific, well, why, why are we on this journey? Why, why should we put so much time and effort? It's simply because it, uh, for the 320 and beyond, it helps us as a church move along the journey that we're called to. Uh, you know, we all give, we all serve in many different ways. I understand that. A lot of people are committed to other and, and give a lot of money to other initiative. There's a lot of good Christian work. I support missionaries as well as other endeavors, but this enables us as a body, as a church, to reach the needs that we need to reach in order to be faithful with our calling. And it's all based on this, and close with this, Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able, and this is the 3.20 that the whole 320 and beyond is based on, to him, Jesus, who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. It's not based on our power or, or our ability. It's based on his power and his yeah. ability. And we're going to believe that God is able to do that. Will you believe with me? Yeah. All right. Will you go on this journey with me?